Hello everyone, thanks so much for joining me today and I hope that you're all doing well. Today I welcome Richard Atherton to the podcast and Richard is a coach, a consultant and a well-being enthusiast, I love that. He's a partner and leadership development specialist at a company called First Human. It's a firm dedicated to unleashing the human potential within the workplace. First Human provides services such as change management, team building, management consulting, executive coaching, and leadership development. So I'm going to speak with Richard about how they bring in the human side to businesses with leadership development and all the other services that they do provide. Richard is also an enthusiast of therapy, uh, specifically primal therapy, and he's so kind and generous to share with us today his experiences and how it did help him and continues to help him. But Richard also has his own podcast called Being Human, which is fantastic. He's got over 200 episodes up there now with lots of different guests, lots of different topics. So the link will be in the show notes. So I hope you do go and check it out. I'm still a baby podcaster. This is my second year. I only upload uh, twice a month due to my schedule. So I'm learning and I'm still learning. And I really learned a lot about Richard today. So I I know that you'll enjoy it. Let us know in the comments. And also, if you follow Richard or if you've been on his podcast, been on his show, give him a shout out. Let him know. So without further ado, let's welcome Richard to the show. Richard, thank you so much for being here today. Lovely to see you. Fantastic to see you. So I want to start out about your business, talking about First Human. I love the name by the way. Um, Thank you. I came up with it in the bath. Oh, wow. Well, some of the best ideas are born in the bathroom, I think. Whatever you're doing, yeah, I think that's true, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. yeah, There's a theory as to why that's true, but that's another story. (laughs) Is it Freud related? (laughs) No, it's to do with the idea that you're earthed when you're in the shower and you're birthing. You're very often connected to the earth and that uh, encourages hemispheric integration left brain and right brain integration so the theory goes uh because because it puts you into a a, an optimal electromagnetic state and that allows for creativity as well as the fact of course you haven't got the distractions but you know the the electromagnetic effect of being earth also supposedly plays a role oh wonderful i love that it does make sense though that would make sense the elements the energy everything yeah yeah we've got this negatively charged heat you know mm-hmm. uh, electron sink called the earth it, it just gives us that grounding i've been grounding for years i've had some well anyway, that's another tangent sorry well uh, we're yeah. gonna get to that actually yes because i love grounding but yeah but that makes sense so thank you for that because no that's really helpful um i thought it was freud you know everything to do with freud is about out jesting in jest <laughs> you know so um it may be that as well. <laughs> I'm not familiar. Well, uh, so yes, so your business, you work as a consultant, and yep. it's really helping people within business. Yeah, I suppose more aware of how they relate. So why would a business seek out your your services? Yeah, so we work in in three main ways. The, the first is uh, leadership development programs. Um, where we take people of maybe 15 to 20 people at a time uh, and then we'll put them through a series of sessions uh, and we'll invite them into uh, inquiries about who they are about where they come from their life story how they as you say as that how they relate to other where they get blocked where they get triggered uh we yeah we get into that work with them uh, and very often it transforms their relationships themselves to their families to their colleagues uh, it opens them up to explore new possibilities uh, for where they can take their business who they can be as a leader in the workplace so we just we create this this space which allows for both a depth of inquiry and a an outward exploration of possibilities uh, and that's what we do with them i suppose we all know there's different boundaries in a workplace, isn't there, than yeah. within your personal relationships. 
and that may cause a different dynamic. I mean, when we look at group work or the group mind and things like that, mm. is that the case? Um, I think it's true that there are certainly different norms in the workplace. I think it's changing, but even yeah, right now that th- there still are quite different norm- norms in the workplace. Maybe for, maybe for good reason. Uh, I would say that the work that we do probably pushes about as far as you could go with some of the business norms in terms of what we get into with individuals. Uh, but when people are permissive of that and allow, and allow us to work with with people at a deeper level, they they get the benefits, right? Because if certainly in my experience, the deeper we go, the 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 more profound the change we can make in our, in ourselves and how we relate to others, and and the more sustainable that change is. Wow, I wish that was around uh, when I first started out in business because I was in LA in Hollywood and I was doing lots of extra work on sets and oh. I watched directors, ADs, producers shouting at people and calling them names. And it's actually one of the reasons I trained in stress management. That was my very first training. In okay. But when I saw that, I thought, okay, there's lack of impulse control here. But also, everybody just took it. So it's a work environment. And I suppose the arts can create something very different than perhaps a tech company. Mm. And I suppose you, you guys see different, lots of different companies. Yeah, yeah, we work across all the sectors because it's the same, it's basically the same set of questions we ask whoever is in front of us, whether you make glasses yeah. or, or bottles, which is one of our clients at the moment, make bottles or whether you're working for a media company and we've had lots of media companies over the years. So yes, it's it's the same. Um. It's the same set of questions, but yeah, of course, you get different cultures across the, the sectors, and yeah, uh, as you allude to, when you're working in a media environment, you tend to get a, a livelier set of characters and a, probably a bit more diversity of personality and expression uh, in the media space, for sure. And you mentioned culture, because people do talk about the culture of a company, the culture of a business, um, the culture of a workplace. Can that be difficult to dismantle, to identify, um, or does it come out through the questions that you guys ask and the work that you do? Yeah, so so culture is not something we, I mean, it's something I've done work, a lot of work in that space, in the culture space. It's not something that the first human specifically focuses on. We, um, But what we find is that when we do work at the leadership level, and we go to work with individuals and they transform who they're being, a natural outcome of that is a change in culture of the organizations that they're leading. So uh, cultural transformation often comes as a as a byproduct of the work we do with leaders. Um, but yeah, we tend not to, and there are other firms that do, and it's, there's definitely a, a whole world of people who go directly at culture change. Uh, and that's a, yeah, that's, that's uh, but that is possible to do it's difficult to do uh but certainly uh it's possible to completely transform cultures and the podcast that, that i do being human we have a we've had a ton of stories of of you know head to toe changes in culture um that have been uh, accomplished yeah you know, by by leaders when we look at culture as well i don't know if it's necessary to even go in looking to change culture i think it does show up and sometimes it comes from the top as well. Mm. And also you've had several incarnations, I'm going to call it, uh, in your career and kind of coming up to where you are now. Mm. Uh, you've been a stand-up comic. Uh, you ran a goth club. Uh, you've also did a burlesque comedy. I was, an, I was a burlesque empresario. Amazing. Tell yeah. us a bit about how you sort of went through these phases of of work and career. Yeah, I, I think, um, I suppose there's always been a bit of a tension, perhaps, in my personality between wanting to be like the the dutiful son who you know gets the good job and the good salary and uh, does the establishment thing, and uh, so certainly, you know, when I left got a degree in engineering and got a good job in what was then Arthur Anderson you know a big global consulting firm and uh versus this definitely this sort of 
tug in the other direction is to just to go out and, and well quite literally join the circus or <laughs> create a circus which is pretty much what i did uh so so yeah that, i think that's always that's always been a tension in 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 my personality uh and i guess it's just one side as one or the versus the other you know and i've probably sort of shifted back and forth between expressing one part or the other certainly over the sort of first half of my career it feels like it's settling down a bit now uh with all the, the therapy work i've done and the deeper deeper work it, i think it's just had a uh a sort of calming effect on you know my expression in the world uh but yeah that's definitely a a, a tension there the kind of good boy and the and the wild child yeah absolutely I, and i think we all have that dichotomy sort of thing um the dreamer mm. young's archetypes too i think they all play in in some way um but you know I'm not proposing any particular school of thought, but it's all out there, really. Mm. When you jump into therapy, which we'll talk about as well, you will explore and you may even explore more. And then some of it may be repressed then. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think a lot of, uh, yeah, I think, I think in, in some ways, as much as the therapy has definitely, has certainly had a sort of stabilizing effect on on my personality, I would say it's also... You, you, what I found is that you sort of open up those parts of you that didn't get expressed as a kid, and then you want to you want to find outlet for it. I mean, I, I had a guest on my podcast recently who'd who'd been working as a strategist, corporate strategist, his whole career. He did some some spiritual work and you know spent time you know in India and retreats and so on, and then came back to his life and and took up a, a kind of side career as a as a DJ. And that was, and that was, as he saw it, something that never got for him had never got expressed as a kid. That love of music and, and creativity and so on. So, so now he's a corporate strategist and a DJ. Wonderful. This is a hell. Well, I believe it's a very healthy way to approach life, um, especially past thirty. <laughs> you know, because you're approaching that mid mid age kind of mid life. Mm. The way you're looking back, going, oh, I wanted to be Jimmy Page, or I thought I was Robert Plant, but maybe I'm not, <laughs> you know, and maybe that will never happen, you know. So it's reality tech, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think when you get, it's interesting when you get to a certain level of, of sort of financial security. You know, a lot of people do have that ability, right? They they can afford to go to maybe three days a week in their substantive career and spend a bit of time doing other things, um, which maybe you don't have that opportunity in your 20s, let's say, where uh, it, it's a bit, you may not have the responsibilities, but you probably don't have the same kind of level of earning power. So it's it's interesting that, yeah, you do you do get a, a lot of people. And, and yeah, I think that's increasingly happening, actually, is, is people are opening up. I think the pandemic accelerated that trend, right? It's like, you know, what am I doing in this job? You know, I've been wanting to do X for all these years. And so I do think we're seeing a, a slight shift in people's attitude to their careers. And maybe they don't need to be as, you know, as linear or as singular uh, as they'd want so soon. Yes, it's singular, definitely. Uh, because, yeah, the pandemic certainly forced us all, I think, to go a little bit more, become a little bit more introspective. Yeah, and because that's all we could do, <laughs> stare at ourselves most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes, interesting. But talking about that, sort of that introspection, and I know John Lennon did primal therapy. Mm. Uh, the Beatles kind of really pushed okay. that out there. Uh, he, he had a lot to say about it, as I recall. Yeah, he wrote songs about it. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. Didn't wasn't there an album or something about it? Uh, well, they certainly. I think on the album he did in collaboration with Yoko Ono. Oh, there was the song "Mother." Right? Oh yes. Oh wow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he now, I is that something that you've tried as well? And yeah, you... I mean that's pretty much. I suppose in some ways that defines my my therapy journey or yeah my emotional healing is is my primal therapy work yeah i found it um well initially through i was in a 12-step group and somebody 
um, recommended me John Bradshaw's work. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that homecoming, you know, and his, his inner child work. Inner child um, work, got all his books. Wonderful. Yeah. So I started with that and found a therapist who was very kind of, a was a very aligned with that John Bradshaw way of thinking. Um, but what became quite clear in my work with that therapist, as much as she was wonderful, I was starting to dig into my birth trauma and Bradshaw doesn't really touch birth trauma. Uh, and it was is Janov who's who had a lot to say about birth and birth trauma. And I had a traumatic birth. Um, and whilst there were certainly sort of traumatic aspects of my childhood, the the big trauma for me was was my birth. And so that led me to Janov's work and and uh and ultimately to Santa Monica and you know, a decade or more of of doing primal therapy. Yeah. Wonderful. Um I envy you a bit about that because it's just not available uh, in the UK as such. You know, um, I know people who would really benefit from that and there's no equivalent. Well, I haven't found. And I think you've got to be trained in a particular way. Or am I am I wrong about that? Is there something else? No, I, 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 think, I think you're absolutely right about that. I, I think there are supposedly some 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 trained primal therapists in the uk but they're hard to find i've never found one um yeah i mean i was just lucky i had the resources you know at the time i got into it i didn't have dependence i was making a lot of money doing uh the consulting work that i was doing so i could like do six months of of consulting save a bunch of money go live on the beach in santa monica and do primal therapy every day for six months come back rinse and repeat and i basically did that for five years and you know extremely privileged to be able to do that, I, I absolutely get that for most people, you know, even a single session would be, you know, c quite an investment, right? You might spend, say, like 150 pounds on a session because primal sessions can run, you know, two, three, four hours. Um, so, yeah, I'm acutely aware of the, the the privileged position I was in to be able to do that. Um, I mean, it might not look very privileged, but you're, you're sort of rolling around the round, screaming and crying your eyes out for sort of eight hours a day. But in terms of the benefits, yeah, enormous. I'm an advocate for it. So I certainly believe in it. And that's why I'm saying it was privileged. I mm. Because you do need that mentoring, though, too. And general, uh, I, I don't know. I know he trained people. And I think you have interviewed somebody on your podcast who you trained as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's been a few, yeah. Yeah, so it can, you can still get primal therapy, but you do need to go, I would advise people, you do need to do your research and go to the right person. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I see... and. I don't. I don't. I, speak, I don't have a great deal to go on, but for my personal experience, it was the deepest and most effective um, form of therapy. But I, I also think the broader principle of trauma release work, and and there are manifold ways to get into your trauma. I mean, I've done rolfing, which is another way into your trauma. I know that people do the holographic breath work and find that as a way to get in the trauma. I know that there's people who use the plant medicines, and that's a way to. So I, I think the broader principle of finding ways to get into that buried pain and finding ways to resolve it is is the most important one i happen to believe that primal therapy is possibly the best way to, to do it to do the work um but as i say I, I you know i'm biased i i think that the broader idea of finding ways to surface your trauma and resolve it is what's what's most important never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Yes. Um, I, I know people who've been through it, who live in LA. I've lived in LA for many years before uh, moving to the UK. So I can advocate for that. Um, and I know it works. I've seen people change. So I know it works. Um, but, you know, is that what we call, would you call that the deep work? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would say anything that allows you to access those, yeah, parts of you that that you, you've 
suppressed um is the deep work and yeah you can you can get to that through the body you can get to that through the breath you can get that that through a, a you know a dialogue which is the way the primal works um but the yeah the important part is getting to those deeper places which are usually hidden it's how mm. i believe we survive it's how we can get up get dressed and get out every mm. day. Have to be hidden um and it's a survival technique uh, but as you say as you rightly say there are different ways to get there you know breath work re rebirthing i've seen people do rebirthing it is all very different though it's not primal therapy so just <laughs> to be clear no. about it. I, I I think that primal therapy is the most refined of those techniques. You know, that's my experience and you know, sort of my hypothesis, I suppose, is that, that they he was such a dedicated scholar, Arthur Genoff himself, and he you know, he was working at so many levels simultaneously. I do I do think the guy was a genius. You know, he he was looking at the you know, the neurology, the the physiology, the the the, the style of therapy itself, the yeah, you, know, you know, he yeah, he he just thought so deeply about that process of of accessing and re releasing trauma in a way that I'm not sure anybody else has. Yes, there's lots of schools of thought about trauma, trauma mm. work, uh, trauma bonding. There's a lot out there, um, and certainly when I was doing my psychology, I it didn't touch upon it very much. Uh, it, you know, it's all about other things so mm. there is a sec particular sector that does put does concentrate on it and then i believe when you're doing a master's in psychology or something you don't really go deep even my psychotherapy course didn't go deep into trauma work we touched upon it and so you've got to do the research and i think going through it just like going through therapy is a learning curve as well yeah yeah, that's been my experience. I thought, well, I, I mean, I, I had to go, I had to go across the other side of the world to find a therapist who would go that deep with me. And I was dealing with some of the people on, you know, on the cutting edge of psychotherapy work in the UK. So I think you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a niche. Um, people don't tend to want to go there, and for understandably, right? I mean, if if I could have chosen to if i if there was a way for me to have a satisfying fulfilled life that meant i never had to go to primal therapy i would have 100 percent chosen it chosen it because it's highly disruptive it's expensive it's painful you, i mean that's the whole process is getting into your pain um and and relieving it, it there's it's yeah it's not a pleasant way to spend your time <laughs> And there's something I disagreed with Janoff with because he'd say, "Oh, people come here and they tell me that they feel such relief after doing the work with me." I'm like, "Not my experience." I felt absolutely wiped out after a session, and it was damn painful. And it and I spent most of the time after the sessions also, in, you know, in tears. And um, it, yeah, it was, yeah, it, it, it's it's a. Uh, it's like an extreme, you know, sort of something like an extreme sport. I, I would say it's, you know, yeah. it, it, you've got to have a level of dedication to put put your body through it. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, but I like that because what you're saying is really overall, even if, even if it's not primal therapy, therapy itself is a long haul. It's not mm. sessions, and you're okay. And sometimes there are issues, things like grief. Um, things like, I don't know, stopping smoking. Uh, Some mm. can have a few sessions for something. Um, yep. But therapy overall is not a quick fix. No, it's not a quick, it's absolutely not a quick fix. And I remember getting some advice once when I started, because I started with the 12 step rooms. You know, my first sort of route into this healing was, you know, the abstinence. And uh, yeah, somebody said, to me very early on it takes 10 years to get your marbles back and another 10 years to learn how to play with them so i think i was very lucky to to have my expectations set in terms of decades uh very early on um and and you know that's obviously something that pertains to those you know to the to the 12 step route for recovery but absolutely applies to therapy as well yeah absolutely 
And I think some people do believe that he's made the step now, jumped in, going to do therapy. Oh, I love my therapy. Well, something's not quite right if you're loving, loving, loving. <laughs> I'm yeah. what I'm doing now. Um, yeah, but so it's not, you know, therapy. In fact, I think that's a, that's a great signal that it's not working. I had a therapist who was more psychoanalytical. He was a bit more sort of Jungian, you know, psycho mm -hmm. psychoanalyst. And uh, I'd come out of, a, out of the session feeling great. It's like I've had all of my, you know, dysfunction validated, you know, and for about three or four hours after the sessions, I felt on top of the world. And then the same compulsions and addiction would all sort of rise up, and and I, you know, and I'd be back to square one, and and it wasn't it wasn't providing me with any sustainable shift in who I was, um, and and you know, for much as the guy was well intentioned, he just wasn't working at the right level, um, for, in order to have me heal. He was working at a cognitive level, and he in the session, and for some period afterwards, I was able to kind of have a sort of bump in self-esteem and feel a bit better about myself but yeah and 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 there may have been certain conditions for that was that for which that would be perfect but um and effective yeah but not for me it's a good point though that you may have to have several bouts of therapy or several bits of therapy um with different people because everybody will have their own expertise um i yeah psychoanalysis you know lying on the couch frightening probably <laughs> i would say that's probably top two or second to primal therapy uh, for me right it's not for everyone it's not for everyone i think so no no out. have you had psych uh, psychoanalysis yeah so that's what i was saying yeah so the guy i had was more in the psychoanalytic space who um yeah, he would just tell me, oh, well, you know, the, the, these, I mean, at the time I was dealing with a lot of sexual compulsion, you know, these, this is all just natural. This is your template. This is who you are. Um, you shouldn't feel any shame about this. And, and, and I'd be, oh, okay. I, I thought I had a problem. It turns out I don't have a problem. But then, yeah, as I'd say, like a few days after the session, all this sort of shame would come back and the same compulsions that I didn't feel good about, would, you know, would come back. And it, it just, it, it wasn't helping. Yeah, that that's that makes sense though. If he was young and trained, um, mm. I'm gonna try and stay away from all the mod modalities as much as I try. It how comes in? I had a Freudian psychoanalyst, and I think he would have addressed um, the deeper stuff. He would have gone mm. into the Oedipus. He would have gone into stuff. And I will say that because maybe people have experienced this. The Freudian work will be a lot about what you hold in and what you let out. Um, and so then the work is being done. A lot of stuff's being touched. But, you know, again, that kind of training out there, um, he's my analyst has passed away now. When I saw him, he was in his late 70s, you know, so uh, but brilliant work. But he was trained in, in that way. And some of the training's been diluted as well. So I'm concerned about a lot of those things out there for people seeking therapy. Um, yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think you've got to kiss a lot of frogs. I think, yes. lot, I think a lot of the work doesn't go deep enough. I heard yeah. an expression on a, on a podcast this morning that, that the issues are in the tissues. Yeah. Right? Oh, excellent. And, and I think that's something that, 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 yeah, certain factions of the, of the psychotherapy community are latching on to right this is an embodied state you know the, the, the these trauma patterns exist in the body and we've got to go deep to have any impact on them we can't just keep it in the mind we can't just keep it cognitive it, it, you know, for, for, yeah for as i say for sustainable profound change Absolutely. You're, you're not going to analyze your way out of your trauma <laughs> You're not going to get, yeah. you, you know, any number of insights about why. I mean, that was the other thing about when I was doing the analysis. I'd be like, oh, I'd get these these really gratifying insight, insights into, oh, that's why I'm attracted to this or that. But again, the insight in itself doesn't cause you a If you've not done the work on the on the buried pain, it, the insights in itself is, you know, it's like candy floss. It's, it's just, you know, it sort of just melts away. And it, it, what have you done? You've you've enjoyed some some sugar on a stick, right? But you've not. You've not done the work. 
Exactly. So, and, and and that brings me to the point about, you know, the issue of the insight. You can read all the books. You can, you know, sometimes people say, is there a book I can read? Well, yes, there's lots of books you can read. I could send you a whole list, uh, but I don't know if it's going to help. Uh, you know, you the information will go in, but you've got to do the work. And the body work and this is where my sort of spiritual practice, and I did struggle when I first started practicing. I had, you know, spiritual component to my practice and then the psychotherapeutic part. But I've reconciled myself with all that. And, but I think mind, body, soul does help. And you do have to get into the body, I think. Otherwise, yeah. it's all in the head. And that's where the problem started, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the head is is what helps us stay, I think, a, a separated from our pain. Mm. You know, the, the mind gives us these narratives and justifications for all of our behaviours, and it, it's really the, the central organiser of our defences against the pain. And that ke- and that helps us survive, and that keeps us functional in the world, and it forms our personality. Um, but if you, you you've got to you've got to get underneath them. Mm-hmm. Like trying to ju- trying to just sort of manipulate the defenses doesn't help. Ultimately, you, you've you've got to find ways to have yourself drop those defensives and sink into the pain, whether that be through the breath, whether that through the body, whether it be through a very skilled therapist like a primal therapist. But you, you you've got to find a way to get yourself out of the out of your of those mind patterns, not analyze them. Exactly. <laughs> it's the wrong place. Exactly. <laughs> And for some people who are quite left brain minded, they need some analysis to go away. To, I, I like to call it the cotton ball. So, and then so people are relaxed a bit more now. And then you and then you go. You have to go in. You mm. have to say, okay, this is you know this cotton ball there. It feels nice and soft. Now that you're comfortable, let's get to it. Yeah, let's get to it. So there's ways in which you learn how to work, I think. And I like to transfer that to life so that people leave. Because for me, as a therapist, at some point, you've got to take the lead and go out there. So my job is to get it to help you to come to these realizations and the skills and do a bit of cotton balling, yes. But then you're going to come in with a sledgehammer and knock a few bits out. And yes, you may take to your bed for a few days, but that's okay. Yeah. You, you, you know, you took you you drowned yourself out with drugs for ten years, so take to your bed for three days. <laughs> that's fine. Or yeah. whatever it is, you know. You, yeah, or a year. Like one of my yeah, one of my therapists, Frank, said when we first started doing primal, he basically didn't get out of bed for a year. He just cried every day for a year. I mean, and that's yeah. That's what it takes sometimes. I mean, I, I wasn't far off that. I just sort of did it at intervals. But yeah, it's being acknowledging, being kind to yourself. And when you come from a household, if you come from a household where neither of your parents were any of those things, they may have been self-absorbed, you mm. know, and left you to be self-reliant. Then you may grow up not being self-reliant, not thinking, "Oh, I need a rest." Yeah, people yeah. badly. I need to say something. Mm. People become passive to the abuse. Yeah, and then people abuse themselves with yeah. substances or relationships. Yeah. yeah, that's such a that's such an important point. Um, and even before I got into therapy, some of the very early work I was doing in the twelve step rooms. There's this one meeting I went to for called uh, yeah for Codependence Anonymous, and you had these sheets, mm-hmm. and it would just it would say I feel X, you know, I I feel sad, I feel anxious, you know, whatever. And and and, and at the start of the meeting, you give were given one of these laminated sheets. You had to pick one, and and I didn't really know any other expression than I am fine, you know. I was and I was <laughs> Arthur Arthur, Arthur Jadoff used to say pathologically English, right? I just. I wasn't able to give any other expression than I'm fine. And so that 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 first work of just just starting to have a modicum of, of self-empathy and ask myself that question, what am I feeling? Was, was some of the really important opening up uh, that I did be, before I got uh, to to therapy, to proper therapy. 
So, so I think you're right that um, starting to break down that shield that we create around ourselves as a result of of trauma and abuse is important. Important. Absolutely. How are you showing up? What you're doing? What you're saying to yourself? What you say to other people? I love it when people say, "I'm I'm more kind to other people than I am to myself." Mm. I always question that because probably not. You're probably not. <laughs> you probably mean to other people as well. You just right. don't, you don't acknowledge it yet. Yeah. Yeah. So there's yeah. passive aggressive. There's lots of stuff. If you mean to yourself, you are going to somehow, that's, you're not going to be able to sit with that for long. It's going to come out. Mm. Project out. Project out. <laughs> it will come out at some point. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of things we say or believe about ourselves, I think, are untrue. And so therapy, I think, helps us. And people always laugh when I say, look, we need to shrink down. Your, you've got this big, grandiose idea about who you are, what you are, even if you were downing yourself. You think, oh, my problems are huge. But actually, there are millions of people with your problems, with the same problems. And that's where the whole shrink phrase came from and people say really and say, yeah we should be you know helping to shrink the ego mm. i didn't know that's where it came from that's right yeah yes I, yeah i know a lot of people don't know that but that is where it's come from we the role is to help shrink the ego so that we because everybody comes and says look i've got this huge box this huge thing and this huge big trunk of stuff and it's just me i've only got this and yeah, look at me. Hello. And yes, I'm looking, I'm watching, I'm seeing. But um, eventually that box gets a little bit smaller. We keep coming and the box gets a bit smaller. Um, and the box is, of course, representative of the ego. Um, we could talk about cupboards, boxes, lots of different things. Yeah, yeah. That contain, in other words, that contain things, containers. Um, and so, yeah, the ego, I think people think they don't need it. You do, um, but you've got to try if you can with some help and work, uh, work with it. And I think meditation can help with that. I know you've done some, so, and we want to talk about your podcast as well, because I, I, therapy is one of my favorite topics. It's not my favorite, I have to say, <laughs> it's, but it's one of my favorites. I know it's it's ironic, but it's not. Right, given I, I'm looking behind you, nine, nine features therapies, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but yeah, it's not my favorite. My favorite is comedy and things like that. But oh. yes, I love comedy. Um, Sue's the soul. I laugh all day, laugh every, I love it, love it, love it. And I know you do as well. Yeah, 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 uh, yes. Although there was a, yes, yeah, I do love comedy. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I love comedy. Yeah, obviously, yeah, obviously I, I tried being a comedian for a while. I, in fact, I was. I got to yes, the I point. Know. I got to the point where I was starting to get paid for it. But yeah, it was a short-lived career. Oh, a tough, tough role, though. I, how do you stand there in front of all these people and say, "Here you go, oh." Yeah, it's pretty, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty terrifying to begin with. Um, How did you do it? It's so brave. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess you're just driven, driven. I mean, that's so many people in that world, uh, you know, are sort of trauma, trauma bound, isn't it? So it's like the, the desperation for the validation is so strong. You're, you're prepared to put the fears to one side. And it's not like everybody is in that place. I know there are some comedians who, who don't don't fear the audience but yeah i think for me it was like I, I was yeah so desperate for the validation i was prepared to do anything um yeah. any favorite comics uh well the guy i love now is a guy called owen owen benjamin in fact he was the one who gave me that and he's been he's kind of controversial like he's been cancelled for a bunch of stuff and isn't he, everyone yeah he he was in hollywood but kick, got kicked out but yeah, I love his work. I got, and in fact, it was his expression, issues are in the tissues uh, that, 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 oh, uh, that. I, I got uh, got from him this morning. Um, yeah, so he's he's funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm very grateful to comedy because it was comedy that gave me the 
impetus really because i i got i went to this club in north london and and the compare says uh okay tonight ladies and gentlemen you'll see three types of comics uh, some of the comics you see tonight will be on your television screens this was like a for open spots you know the sort of bottom rung of the the circuit uh in 10 years time some of the comics you see tonight will be on your tv screens some of the comics you've seen tonight uh you'll never see again uh and some of the comics you see tonight really should be in therapy and and I heard that, and it just it was like this sort of dagger to my chest. I was like, "Man, you just described, you know, my world." So I, I decided that um, I was better off uh, doing actual therapy than sort of transmuting uh, my trauma into jokes. Uh, so that that was the end of the comedy and the start of real real investment in therapy. I just interviewed a comic in New York. He's amazing. Um, it was one of the questions I asked him, how do you stand there and say, yeah, laugh, go on then. <laughs> you know, that's why I'm here. Laugh. <laughs> it's, I don't know how you do how, That's so brave. Um, you know, people climb Mount Everest. I think that tops Mount Everest. Yeah. Well, the other thing you've got to bear in mind is the most comics is they've been comics since they were kids. I mean, I was. I I was the class, class clown from like six, seven years old. So they actually, the transition from doing it in front of a class of like 20, 30 kids to doing it in front. In, and don't forget, when you start off as a comic, you're not performing to like hundreds of people. You're, <laughs> you're performing to like six people above a pub, right? So, or a bar. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, 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 so you do build up to it and you're kind of doing what you've always done uh except it's not it's not your schoolmates it's uh some strangers but is there anything that makes you laugh that you people would be surprised about well yeah i mean all of the un un pc stuff yeah <laughs> so the the less pc the funnier it is and i think yeah well, I, th I think the corporate world in general has become sort of very corporatized and they have to toe a line to keep you know to keep their gigs and i mean the internet is opening that up but um yeah i don't find any pretty much none of the comedy that on television these days i find i find I, funny or yeah or netflix or anything anything that's basically been sanctioned by uh the mainstream is not funny and um yeah so that i i kind of go to the fringes of the internet to, to find my comedians these days yeah i i like the dark humor so for me, it's dry humor, Stephen Wright, or the older comics, George Carlin. Um, I do like Ricky Gervais. Ricky Gervais is about as as close, you know, he pushes it as about as far as he can, right? He's uh, and, and just about stays on that side of not being cancelled. So, yeah, he's still funny. Have you heard of Norman Cousins? No. So he was a, he was, I think he was an engineer as well, uh, but he laughed himself well. So he got quite ill, quite very ill. If you look him up, you'll, he's on, he's there. Mm. He's passed on now, but when he was very ill, he watched funny films the whole time and he got better and better and better. So comedy heals. I, I think that's right. I think that's right. And, and it seems so close physiologically, doesn't it, to crying? Uh, that, that that has me wonder is it not a kind of a similar process that's going on here it seems so so close um crying for me is painful i don't mm. like laughing but crying hurts <laughs> Most like, of it, it, yeah but i just i just when i just look at the the body mechanics of it right they're very they're very similar and there's even a form of therapy isn't there that the sort of that, that sort of shaking shaking therapy that i think there's something in that right i think when we put our body into that sort of autonomic sort of state we we we're shaking something out definitely weird things can make you laugh i think and i think i'm saying these things because viewers listeners out there whatever you find funny even if it's not pc just have the belly laugh yeah just do it just laugh don't feel guilty about it just <laughs> Nobody's watching. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's there's even uh, yaf, laughing yoga. I had a guest on the on the podcast who was into that. Yeah, swore yeah. by it. Yeah. Let's talk about your podcast as well because I love being human. Um, do you have any particular daily practices before I get to that that make you feel human? 
so yeah, I've really got into the Vedic meditation. I actually didn't do it last night or this morning. I've got a little bit of a cold and uh, I just chose to to go for the for the sleep instead. But um, I do that twice a day. So I do it uh, in the morning and in the evening. And interestingly enough, I skipped it last night. I was just, yeah, just feeling a bit heavy and just, oh, I'm just going to sleep. And then I woke up at 4 a.m. And I I never wake up in the night. It just hasn't happened since I started meditating. And it's interesting that one day off the meditation in the evening and I get disturbed sleep. So um, so I think, I think in terms of it's much easier to be a, a good human on eight hours sleep than, than not. Um, so that alone is... Uh, a reason for me to do meditation um and and i continue to do uh i effectively do self priming now i uh, i don't i don't i don't have a primal therapist right now um but i keep up the journaling and i've got to the point where what do they say you know you first start you first you're you're trying to master a skill and then it masters you and that's where i feel like i've got to the primal i basically can, cannot resist now the, the pain coming up and um well i mean i can <laughs> I, I can zip myself up and but it's it, it's big it's become so natural for me now to uh to feel into the pain when i've been triggered by something um to allow the tears to come to get to the resolution um that it's just part of my lifestyle now yeah i'll just find myself on a train or on the couch or in a moment and you know just the, the, when it's there to come up it will come up I'll do the processing. I'll get to the tears, um, and and then I'll, you know, it takes a bit of recovery time. After some recovery time, I'll I'll then get back on with my day. Um, so that is something I just yield to. Basically, I don't have to put any effort into it. I just I just yield to to that work when it presents itself. Um, and then I'm, I'm doing yoga. I'm, I go to the gym. I recently took up jujitsu, which I'm loving. Um, so I'm doing that. I cycle. All of that helps. I'm really good with my diet. You know, it's a lot of raw food, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of organic, a lot of juices. I've got <laughs> carrot juice right now. So, yeah, I keep, I think, yeah. So I, I just, the earthing, earthing makes a massive difference. You know, I've been, I've been earthing every night for years. i um, got an earthing sheet in my bed and that, um, yeah, that makes a big difference. I've got an, <laughs> I'm sitting, whoops, uh, this interview right now. Let's see if I can do this. This is an oh, earthing mat. So my, you know, as I'm talking to you, uh, my wrists are connected to via that sheet, the earth. Um, so, yeah, there's a smattering. There's probably some I've forgotten. I've kind of become a health and well-being geek. Uh, and I think, I, and I, I again, I, I relate that to the therapy because as I become more in touch with myself and I just just become more whole i become much more sensitive to my environment and it's possible for me to notice the difference between how i feel if i eat a burger or a, eat a raw salad or if i've been working at my desk for two hours not being earth versus being earth you know so i just i think i have become yeah m much more attuned to my own well-being and health and then i become compelled to make changes in order to optimize my my well-being so uh, hence all the practices I just mentioned. Yes, but it does show as well that it's something you consciously make an effort to do. Mm. Um, and I think your example of not doing your meditation, lesson, maybe you've explored why you didn't already. But yeah. it, and you're right, I agree. Those things really help to support us. Um, do you do it because you do your meditation? Do you do any visualization or grounding where you maybe see yourself or feel yourself connected to the earth? Well, I don't do any, I don't do any sort of psychological work. I just do the physical, right? The physical, you know, I just make sure I am, I am grounded as much as I can be. Um, but yeah, as a sort of medita meditation as well, I, I don't do that. Um, no, uh, yeah. no. Uh, the, the, the Vedic meditation is, is focused on this repetition of a mantra. Um, yeah, which has a, which has a sort of psychological grounding effect. Um, but yeah, not that, not those, and, and I think I know what you mean in terms of those sort of grounding meditations. I don't do those. Meditational 
grounding where you feel almost as though you've got stakes coming from your feet into the earth. And they find it really powerful that they become like this, you know, so supported. Um, yeah. When we got to that part, all of a sudden do that <laughs> because they felt like the earth was, had made their back straight or something. It's all mind body. Yeah. No, that's uh, that sounds fun. I tell you, just when you mentioned posture, the thing I hadn't talked about is I've been getting into the the tuning fork work. Oh, right. Where you, um, I have a tuning fork and I, I place it on different parts of the body and allow for a resonance with, uh, with the frequency that the fork is tuned to. And I find that, but back to your posture point, I immediately, I thought there's this one spot just under my nose, and if I put the tuning fork there, I immediately get this sort of very, uh, uh, very good, very good posture. So it's uh, just so, started playing with that. The, the, this idea of the electric body and oh yes, us as an electromagnetic being, it's uh, something I'm just starting to explore. Yeah, and and it's all connected, isn't it? But your podcast, um, being human, why did you start the podcast? Uh, initially, it was because working in the corporate world, I felt that there were certain I I topics that were taboo. And, and I think they are still, to, to a great degree. It's changing, and and I wanted to sort of, I wanted to shift the Overton window within the the business world. So, what it's okay to talk about in a business context? You know, can we talk about the impact of childhood trauma on people's performance at work? Can we talk about whether or not being earthed makes a difference in you know who we are in a workplace? Uh, yeah. Can we talk about diet and its impacts and on performance at work? Like all of these topics, I wanted to create a podcast that just opened up that window, uh, and that's so that's the main reason for doing the podcast. Yeah. Amazing! And how long has it been going now? Uh, we're in like two hundred and fifty something episodes, two hundred and fifty six something like that. So, yeah, we're doing one every week. So pretty well, virtually every week. So five years. That's incredible. Uh, yeah, congratulations on that because Thank you had some amazing guests as well. I know. Yeah, it's been great. It's been great. Great stuff. Very informative, educational as well. Lots of different topics. I like the one about psilocybin. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Neil, Neil Mark. Yeah. And then that, there's a good example, right, of how the business. This is a guy who worked for McKinsey, worked for hedge funds, and now he's setting up mushroom retreats. And, and his plan is to get executive teams to come out and do mushroom retreats right i mean that's be <laughs> imagine there. that like even five years ago right could you imagine someone with that as an aspiration so definitely that the world is changing i think the people will be there i think they will go. <laughs> i think they will go so um he's on the right track there i think um but yes you had other people talk about um you had a psychologist talk a, a bit about um uh psychotropic drugs or maybe yeah there's there oh i'm blanking on his name but yeah he he, he was using m uh i think his main thing was using mdma in therapy um and i use drugs in therapy but just not not any of the psychotropic ones but i had a um a particular drug that um suppressed brain stem activity which meant that when i was doing the, the sessions i was getting really deep into my birth trauma it would just somewhat take the edge off mm -hmm. that um that way well, it would it would dampen the brainstem activity which of course gets invoked in when you're reliving birth trauma and so it just made for it to be easier to access that and stay with it for longer uh with the birth trauma for longer and so i found that um that did make a difference for a while uh so yeah i'm all for people experimenting on how using drugs to induce slightly altered states or slightly different brain patterns might help with the therapeutic process. I think it's important work. Yeah. Definitely. I agree. And lots of universities, um, I know King's, um, King's College, they're doing lots of studies and trials mm. um, for using psilocybin. So there's a lot of people out there uh, working with it. It's important work as well. Um, just one couple of two quick questions uh, before we end. Sure. Existentialists believe that, you know, we 
come into this world alone, we leave it alone. I just wonder what your take on that is. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I mean, when I do my meditation, and I, you, I, don't, I sometimes get those moments in meditation where you get this, you enter some altered state. And it certainly feels like I'm connected to something. Um, you know, the atheist might say, oh, you've just, you've just reached a, a very relaxed state. That's all it is. Um, but it certainly my, my intuition is that there's a, con there's a connection to something. Um, and so there's that, which has me wonder whether, whether there may be something we come from and go back to. And then, uh, and then I think also my, my sense is that we are, tapped into informational fields and i don't know if you were familiar with the work of richard sheldrake and his idea of the morphic field and but this idea that we there's a there's a sort of there's an informational in, in field that we're interacting with um and and some of that resonates with me as well i think yeah um and we had a guy who was looking at the fourth state of water on the show recently so this is the idea that there's there's ice there's there's vapor, there's there's just normal water, and then there's um this this EZ water, EZ water, which is uh, like a like a gooey consistency um that he's claiming can can hold memory. And there's some studies that have been done where they'll take, you know, a beaker of walk water, this was with DNA that had encoded in it a certain uh uh DNA codes. Uh that was in one beaker of water of this EZ water. And then they found the same pattern had been replicated in a beaker next door to it, but separated through space, uh, which had the same pattern in it. So, I mean, that begs two questions. How is it that water is storing this information, but also has this information transferring through space? So, so when, when I come across studies like that, I'm, I'm sort of forced to question, well, okay, is, is there some, yeah, field that we're interacting with that's carrying information. Um, and so is that is that something that is animating us, as you say? Is that something that we somehow come from when we incarnate? Like those are questions I find myself asking. Yeah. Not that I've come to any answers. Yeah, well. Yes. Okay. Interesting stuff there. Hmm. Yeah, because the whole idea of why we exist or the existential exist um, is has been uh, pondered for centuries. Yeah, um, and we'll continue to something. Well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You on your podcast, really? Yeah, I did. I <laughs> made it my Vedic meditation teacher made a prediction. He 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 predicted that I was going to go get much more into these these spiritual questions over the next few years that's what that's what he thought so we'll see whether that is my my destiny i mean i've been pretty much exclusively focused on just not being fucked up you know, just being just being healthy and stable that's that was that's been my goal until now but maybe i'll Priority. have some space to explore these deeper questions exactly well that's the priority really but yeah existentialism or oh, spirituality and all that's fascinating for me i'm a skeptic mm. now, at most things i feel like i'm a born skeptic i'm always questioning um and have you had any mentors in your life professionally or personally uh yeah a ton of a ton of mentors i suppose um Oddie, my business partner at First Human, he's a great, great mentor. He's been doing this leadership development work a lot longer than I have. So he's been a great mentor as I've been getting into that space, um, as has Philida, another business partner at First Human. Uh, and then on the on the therapy, I mean, in in a sense, therapists are also mentors. Uh, you know, in some in some ways, I think of them like mentors, right? They're they're not just helping you do the work; they're also um, guiding your your path you know down so they're the healing path in some sense um uh, i've had some great yoga teachers um yeah i've got a great jiu-jitsu instructor right now yeah yeah so uh yeah plenty um 
on the podcasting. It's interesting. Actually, I don't really have too many mentors on the podcasting. There's a guy called Brian Rose, another somewhat controversial figure, but works in London. Oh, wow. uh, and he, he, uh, I did his podcast course at the, right at the start, and that, so he helped me very early on get get started with podcasting. So yeah, so yeah, I've been very grateful to have had uh, a few people guiding the way along the, you know, uh, along the path. Yeah, it's helpful, isn't it, when we have other people? So I think, um, yeah, it helps inform us as well. Oops. So Richard, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you doing this. I've learned so much as well, and things I didn't know about. So thank you, and we'll continue to watch as well. Weekly, you said? Yeah, weekly. Yeah, yeah, weekly. Usually get it out towards the end of the week, usually Friday, sometimes uh, over the weekend, but yeah. Excellent. Well, the links will all be in the show notes. Thank uh, you. And then we've got a t- telegram we've uh, we've just started up. Oh. Uh, which, which is where I plan to put some of the more, um, you know, spicy memes and uh, opinions and the kind of stuff you probably wouldn't get away with on LinkedIn. So, yeah. Great stuff. Excellent. And those links are on, on your... Um, yeah. Yeah. I can, well, I can, I can send them to you as well, but okay. yeah, you can also find you can get, you can get there from the, uh, from the podcast as well, the YouTube page. Brilliant. And you know, I'm going to predict that I, th- I think there's a book in you. I think you know it. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure why you're hesitating about it, but uh, I hope I hope at some point you. Yeah, I do. I, I do. I do intend to write a book. Um, in fact, I've written like sixty thousand words of a book. I just haven't. Yeah, I need, I need to get it over the line. And I've always felt like I want. If I'm going to stand, because the book I'd love to write is basically how I cured myself through primal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. Because that was the promise of primal therapy, right? It's the cure for neurosis. That was, I think, on the f- may have been the subtitle of Primal Screen. Um, the cure for neurosis, which is extremely bold, right? Because every other psychotherapist is not telling you that they can cure you. They say they can help you with your symptoms, but nobody's saying you can cure. But I found primal therapy to be cura- curative because it works at the lowest level. And once you've once you've resolved that bit of pain, it's gone forever. You know, you, you, ne- you it's gone from your system. The the pattern has been dissolved, and you never have to experience that little chunk of pain again. Like, and as uh, Franz Janoff said, it's like emptying a teaspoon, a bath with a teaspoon, right? And once you've got that little teaspoon of water out of the bath, it's never going back in the bath again. So I do f- think that the primal work is curative, but. In terms of the book, I want to really be able to stand and say, no, I am cured. I'm mean, cured of all my compulsions and addictions. You know, there may be other dysfunctional patterns that um, pertain to who I am, but I'm I'm basically cured of all of my neurosis. I, I, but I, until I can really feel I can say that 100%, I don't want to publish a book. Um, and I don't think I'm there yet. I think I'm very close, and I think it's going to come in the next few years. But until I can really stand behind that claim that I'm cured, I don't want to publish the book. I think you said you, uh, the keyboard, you don't want to publish the book, but I don't know if you've considered that maybe to the process of writing it, it may help um, get you there closer. So, I know Yeah, I- that's that's true. There's probably a few more chapters I could write. Like I said, I've, I've, I've written like 60,000 words, so I could probably write a few more chapters now. That's, that's a good prompt, yeah. No, it will come out. I, I have no doubt. Um, I think it will help a lot of people. Thank you. Thanks for the encouragement. Yeah. Definitely. So get writing. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, have a great rest of the day. Sun is out in London uh, for now. A kind of. Oh, uh, you're. I'm a little bit further north to you. I, I'm. Uh, yeah, it's cloudy here. Great. Well, hopefully, uh, the sun will will come north. Thank you again. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Shah. I've really enjoyed it. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Pages Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, body and soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing you what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep or relaxation. 
The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert in this field, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations that can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy.